Professor Smith will be late for today's lecture. The circulation desk is located on the ground floor. Tutorials are held for two hours every Thursday during semester. International students can get help with locating housing near the university. The student welfare officer can help with questions about exam technique. Most of the students were not able to attend Professor Green's seminar. Some of the references in the essay were old and out of date. We will divide the class into three discussion groups. Every student in the class passed the exam without trouble. There is more detail in the table on page 5. You can get to the college by bus, train or car. We should divide the assignment into three parts and work together.
biologically, the brain is prepared to be shaped by experience. It's expecting um, the experiences that a young child has to literally influence the formation of its circuitry. It's built into our biology. The interaction between genetics and experience that shapes brain architecture is embedded in the reciprocal relationship, relationships that children have with the adults in their lives. And by that we mean um, what we refer to as the serve and return nature. life from non-living matter and this illustration often used is the one of the monkeys at the typewriter okay so we have a monkey sitting at a typewriter and the claim here is basically if you leave chance and time long enough you will get life don't worry about it yes it's strange yes it's wonderful but leave enough matter 600 million years on earth and you will have life so the monkey sitting at the typewriter and the chances are eventually he produces the complete works of Shakespeare so what's the problem so there's no problem, there isn't an issue, right? You just leave him long enough, you'll be fine. And at one keystroke a second, the monkey might well eventually get to the complete works of Shakespeare. But he doesn't manage to do it in 600 million years. So what I decided to do to run the numbers is I, instead of saying type the complete works of Shakespeare, I just ran the numbers for how long would it take a monkey typing at one keystroke a second to type to be or not to be, that is the question, right? On average, how long is it going to take my monkey friend at one keystroke a second? I don't know how long you think that would be. Maybe you could have a guess. Would it be less or more than 600 million years, which is the period life on Earth isn't supposed to have emerged within? And when I ran the numbers, to be or not to be, that is the question, takes 12.6 trillion, 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 trillion years to type just that phrase. And a DNA string, which you have to have for like the life we have now, doesn't emerge in, it's, it's not like, a sentence is worth of information. A DNA string has got as much information as the Encyclopedia Britannica. The way a mother rat takes care of its pups is by licking and grooming, nipple switching, and arch back nursing. So the rats that do a lot of licking and grooming, and there are rats, rats that do very little, but most rats are in between. So that re resembles uh, human, human behavior as well, right? You have mothers that are highly motherling and mo mothers that can care less, and most mothers are somewhere in between. So if you look at these rats, so all you do, you observe them and you put them in separate cages. So you put the high lickers in one cage, not the mothers, but the offspring, and the low lickers in another cage. And then you let them grow, and they're adults now. Their mothers are long buried. And you look in the brain, and you see that those who had high licking mothers express a lot of glucocorticoid -like receptor gene, and those who are low lickers express very little. That reflects a number of receptors. And that results in a different stress response. But this is not the only difference. 
we found later on there are hundreds of genes that are differently expressed. Who would you consult to treat a fear of crowded places, a philosopher or a psychologist? How would most people travel to work each day in big cities like Hong Kong, Tokyo, and New York? Would a supermarket, a cafe, or a bookstore probably have the widest range of products available? In which room of their home would someone usually wash their clothes? Despite all the advances in equality between the sexes, would more men or women play professional football? Which major branch of science deals with classification of living things? In most university courses, there are two ways of being assessed. One is orally, the other is through... Name a month that falls between September and November. Would a town, a village, or a city probably cover the largest area? Which of these would probably be found in most homes around the world? A computer, a bed, or a television? What does the main difference between a wristwatch and a clock relate to?
I'm 43 years old and I owe tens of thousands of dollars in student loans. Oh sure, I knew the loans were piling up as I went through school. But with one loan coming from here, another from there, I had no idea of the rock slide that was building. Fifteen years later, I still experience moments of sheer horror regarding my family's financial situation. My monthly student loan payment is more than triple my car payment. Okay, so without my college degree, I would not have been able to get my current job. For that, I am grateful. But at what cost? My loans have been accruing at a rate of 10%, and now they have burgeoned to, well, I'm an English major, you do the math. I don't think they'll ever get paid off. We're in debt way past our eyeballs, and there's no hope in sight. I'm being kept in class, a financial class of graduates whose only hope for attending college meant borrowing money from the government. Because of our mounting credit card debt and monthly payments that far exceed our family's income, my kids will also join the class of citizens who can't rely on their parents for college support. Do I wish I'd chosen another educational route? You bet. Perhaps trade school. I marveled at how often powerful feel powerless, but in the face of this sense of disempowerment, there's no decline in involvement in organisations which seek to share wealth and opportunities, which seek to protect one another's rights and work towards the common good. According to the UN, civil society groups have grown 40-fold since the turn of the last century. Sorry, since the turn of the yeah, last century. Internationally, the non-profit sector is worth $1 trillion. There are 700,000 not-for-profit organisations in Australia alone. 700,000. The UN recognises 37,000 specifically civil society organisations across the globe. Could you please make welcome our guest lecturer today, Philip G. Zimbardo.
Professor Zimbardo is an emeritus professor of psychology at Stanford University, where he has taught since 1968. After earlier teaching at Yale University, New York University, and Columbia University, he also continues to teach at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey. Professor Zimbardo is internationally recognized as the voice and face of contemporary psychology through his widely seen PBS TV series, Discovering Psychology. His media appearances, best-selling trade books on shyness, and his classic research, The Stanford Prison Experiment. His current research interests are in the domain of experimental social psychology, with a scattered emphasis on everything interesting to study, from shyness to time perspective, persuasion, cults, madness, violence, vandalism, political psychology, and terrorism. He has been a prolific, innovative researcher across a number of fields in social and general psychology. With more than 300 professional articles and chapters and 50 books to his credit, Cook, as some of you might already know, was the son of a Yorkshire agricultural labourer, but what you mightn't know is that he had little formal education. After an apprenticeship to a firm of ship owners at Whitby, he joined, in 1755, the Royal Navy and surveyed the St Lawrence Channel and the coasts of Newfoundland and Labrador. In 1768, Cook was then given command of the Endeavour and sailed on an expedition to chart the transit of Venus. He returned to England in 1771, having also circumnavigated the globe and explored the coasts of New Zealand, which he accurately charted for the first time, and East Australia. Cook next commanded an expedition to the South Pacific of two ships, the Resolution and the Adventure. On this voyage, he disproved the rumour of a great southern continent, explored the Antarctic Ocean and the New Hebrides, visited New Caledonia. Cook's introduction of the observance of strict diet and hygiene prevented scurvy, which had been the scourge of long voyages in this era of exploration. It was one of the seminal turning points in seamen's health and welfare. His other key claim is that he was one of the first Europeans to make extensive contact with a wide variety of indigenous peoples. Here at last was a base from which this largest ocean in the world could be further explored. Many questions were still unanswered. How large was the ocean, and how many undiscovered lands did it hold? Way out in the ocean, not far from Tahiti, did there lie a mysterious continent? Surely if it existed, it would be inhabited, perhaps densely inhabited.
This multi-million selling internet book is still the ultimate handbook for novices and experts alike. It's written in plain English. It covers everything from getting online for the first time to news feeds. This fully revised guide covers all the latest sites and crazes. Whether you've never sent an email or you just want to keep up with the latest developments, this is the book for you. Giorgio Vasari was an accomplished painter and architect, but it is for his illuminating biographies that he is best remembered. He traces the development of Italian art across three centuries to the golden epoch of Leonardo and Michelangelo. Great men and their immortal works are brought vividly to life, as Vasari depicts the young Giotto scratching his first drawings on stone, Donatello gazing at Brunelleschi's crucifix and Michelangelo's painstaking work on the Sistine Chapel, harassed by the impatient Pope Julius II. Deregulation, globalization, and e-commerce are exerting unprecedented pressures on company profits. In this new economic ecosystem, companies must dramatically differentiate themselves from their direct competitors, or risk declining performance and eventual extinction. But how do companies choose the right innovation strategy? or overcome internal inertia that resists the kind of radical commitments needed to truly set the company's offers apart. Illustrating his arguments with more than 100 examples and a full-length case study based on his unprecedented access to Cisco systems, Jeffrey Moore shows businesses how to meet today's Darwinian challenges, whether they're producing commodity products or customized services. For companies whose competitive differentiation in the marketplace is still effective, he demonstrates how innovations in execution can help boost productivity, whether a company is competing in a growth market, a mature market, or even a declining market. For companies in danger of succumbing to competitive pressures, he shows how to overcome inertia by engaging the entire corporate community in an unceasing commitment to innovate and evolve. The drought is such a distinctive and extreme natural experience for the land and its creatures. All-powerful, utterly uncompromising and absolutely uncontrollable. 
Gradually, you must submit to the facts, yet paradoxically you enter into a mild hallucination as you go about your days. A type of natural weirdness prevails, and you give over to this and become part of it. When you live close to the earth, drought induces a kind of trance, a kind of letting go, and a brokenness. You let go of many things, garden plants, various hopes about life itself, and most of all, your remnant and pathetically human notions of normality and perfection. They wither and die in the heat. Good riddance. Yet, strangely, a spiritual vibrance radiates between your senses and the land. A bud burst within, if you like. The absolute truth of the situation begins to gleam, and the idea that truth is beauty becomes very real, and is not only consoling and enlightening, but a sensuous pleasure also. Never before have change and death seemed more natural, or the wild irregularity of an animal's coat seemed more beautiful and astonishing. Travel challenges and offers life-changing experiences that broaden perceptions and knowledge. For me, traveling has become a lifelong quest to expand the taste memory bank, to find different interpretations of what has already been learnt and tasted, with the hope of discovering something new, combined with the constant challenge and desire to take risks and evolve. These experiences have translated directly into my work intellectually, emotionally, and practically. I'll go anywhere where food is a celebration of everyday life, where conviviality and the pleasures of the table are cherished. And it is these places I rely on for constant and ongoing inspiration, like drawing breath. So many places, so many people, so little time, so many adventures to engage in, so much delicious food to taste, so many flavors to experiment with, so much to glean and learn. The more I see, the less I feel I know. Kids of all backgrounds now aspire to a college diploma, yet the parchment's promise to our parents of a, a steady, middle-class living goes increasingly unfulfilled for us, replaced by the burdens of debt. Stella, 31, is one of millions of young people in the United States knocked down by the one-two punch of student loans and credit card debt. Most of us want to do the right thing for the environment. 
but making the commitment to change our fast-paced, convenience-oriented lifestyles can be more than a little daunting. What's the answer? Take that giant commitment and cut it up into 365 little commitments that get met one at a time. This book, The Green Year, does just that. More than a calendar, it offers simple, practical, affordable and engaging activities that make going green a blessing rather than a burden. We spend most of our waking lives at work, in occupations often chosen by our unthinking 16-year-old selves. And yet, we rarely ask ourselves how we got there or what it might mean for us. This work explores the undercharted worlds of the office, the factory, the fishing fleet, and the logistics center, ears and eyes open to the beauty, interest, and sheer strangeness of the Scholarships are the best kind of financial aid you can get because you don't need to pay them back. You should apply to as many scholarships as possible during your junior and senior year and continue to look for scholarships even after you start college. Most scholarships ask you to fill out an application and write an essay on it. Even in the 1940s, it was easy to see how time would soon expand the economist's horizons. The link between security and poverty logically applied to developing countries as well as the developed ones, and the statesmen of the time could see this. The economic health of every country is a proper matter of concern to all its neighbors, near and distant.
In January 1788, the anchors of the sea-battered ships of the First Fleet rattled down into the sparkling waters of Sydney Cove, and 780 of England's most unwanted were herded ashore by their guards, British Navy Marines. The convicts were bullied into some semblance of order to view the raising of the English flag, as Australia became the farthest outpost of the largest empire the world has ever seen. All staff must leave the fire hydrant exit. Article numbers are collected through interesting experiments. Avoid confusing causes of those changes. 